Today's sermon is Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, uh, the baptism of Jesus. Starting in verse 13, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, but do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, making clear who your Son is at, at his baptism and for commissioning, commissioning him to this work to accomplish uh, our salvation. We pray that you'd open up our minds and hearts to receive what you have to teach us in your word. In Christ's name, amen. Well, last week I preached about um, John the Baptist preparing the way in the first part of Matthew 3. And at three points, John's message was repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Uh, two, John's warning, his warning to those who were perhaps not sincere in their repentance uh, and encouraged them to bear fruit in keeping with repentance lest they be judged by God. And then three, John made it clear that the one coming after him is superior, is stronger, is mightier than he is. Okay, and then the next thing we read now is, is that superior one, that one who is mightier than John actually comes to be baptized by John. And we read in verses 13 and 14 that John tries to stop Jesus from being baptized by him because John knows that Jesus is superior. Remember what John said in, in 3.11, he said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, so John knows that he needs Jesus' baptism. He needs the Holy Spirit and fire that Jesus was talking about um, yeah, I wonder if it would be like, you know, let's say I'm teaching confirmation class, you know, to my junior high students. And, and along with those students walks in the door, Dr. Phil Haugen, one of my favorite seminary professors, and he sits down to learn from me. I would immediately say, uh, Dr. Haugen, you need to be teaching me. I should not be teaching you, okay? Something's wrong here. Uh, e even more so in the case of Jesus coming to be baptized by John, especially if we remember that John said that his baptism was for repentance. And the problem there, obviously, is that what does Jesus need to repent of? He had no sin. He didn't need to repent. And so what is going on here? Um, and we, we read about that, at least Jesus responds to him in verse 15. And now I'm moving on to point two of my sermon, if you're following along. But Jesus answered John, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. As you can imagine, uh, there are some differences of opinion on what Jesus means by saying, you know, it's okay to do this, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. It's a little bit confusing to me. And as I read, I think I read five different commentaries on this and, and Sure enough, they all had different ways of explaining it. Um, however, uh, there was some general agreement between, I think, at least four of these commentators. And so I'm going to just share what the general consensus was for, for what Jesus means, why he is submitting to John's baptism. Here's how I'll explain it. And, and this is, again, not from me. It's from these other scholars, kind of a, you know, a summary of what they were saying. <clears throat> Although Jesus himself did not need to submit to John's baptism, the people of Israel certainly did. And so by being baptized, Jesus is identifying with God's people. He has come to be their representative. Um, and so in solidarity with Israel as their representative, and in some sense even in their place, Jesus is baptized by John. 
And he says this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness here perhaps being all that God requires of, of us uh, for, for me to accomplish my work as Messiah. And so by being baptized, Jesus identifies with sinful Israel. I'll just read with you a few of the commentators. R.T. France said that Jesus identifies himself with the repentant people of God in order to fulfill his mission. Jeff Gibbs says that when Jesus was baptized by John, he stood in the place of sinners. We remember he was standing in the Jordan River with likely other sinful Israelites at the time. Benjamin Glad puts it this way, Righteous Jesus identifies with the unrighteous Israelites so that he might save them. And then he makes a good connection to the cross. He continues, At the cross, the righteous one will become unrighteous so that the unrighteous might be declared righteous. And so that last quote makes a connection between what Jesus is doing in his baptism and what he ultimately does in the place of unrighteous sinners on the cross. And so we can say there is general agreement that when Jesus is baptized, he is identifying himself with, uh, with Israel, even with sinners. And this points, of course, to the fulfillment of his mission when he suffers and dies in our place to pay the punishment for our sins and, and to accomplish the atonement and forgiveness of our sins. Now, have you ever done something that you yourself didn't really have to do, but you did it for the benefit of someone else? Um, perhaps at one point you were helping a child learn to read and you'd already taught him the letters and the sounds and now you're reading like a really easy sentence or a book and you get to the word cat and you're reading it out loud and you say, okay, here we are with another word, cat, k, k, at, and you sound out the letters and then it says the cat drank some water. And so you, you get to water and you go, wa, wa, there's a W, wa, wa, t, t, that's a T, er, and, and you, you, you kind of go like that. And you don't have to read it that slowly yourself, but you're doing it for the benefit of the child you're with. Or perhaps you have a friend who um, is, struggles with alcohol and you, encourage them to attend the Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, but they are hesitant to do so, and finally you go with them to the AA meeting. You, you don't struggle with alcoholism, but your friend does, uh, so, but you go with them for, for his or her benefit, okay? Jesus did not need to be baptized, but we do. Jesus did not need to repent, but we do. We cannot possibly fulfill all of God's righteous requirements, but Jesus has. He did this as our representative, as our substitute, and as our savior. He was baptized as part of his mission from God to fulfill all righteousness. And he did this in our place for us. Now, being baptized must have been a very humbling thing for Jesus to do. We remember, of course, that he is John superior. He is the son of God. He had no sin. And, and just think about what it'd be like for him who had no sin to go and stand in the Jordan River to be baptized along with all those other sinners. Okay. Uh, there were tax collectors in there. There were soldiers. There were other people who were considered sinners in those waters being baptized. What were the optics? It looked like Jesus was just like one of them. Okay. How much worse did it look and how much more humbling was it for Jesus to be raised up on a cross right between two criminals, okay, right between two robbers? If you didn't know anything about Jesus, if you hadn't heard his teaching, you walked by, you would have thought, there die three criminals, murderers, robbers, you know? You would have thought that about Jesus. Isaiah 53, 12 says about the Christ that he was numbered with the transgressors. He was numbered or counted with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many. It wasn't his own sin. It, it was the sin of us, of the whole world. And, and so here he did it on a cross, but also even at his baptism, Jesus identifies with sinners. Now let's move on to point three. The Spirit of God rests upon Jesus. Verse 16, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. 
And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Okay, what does this indicate to us? Well, here it helps uh, for readers of Matthew's gospel to be familiar with Isaiah and Isaiah's prophecy. Because there are at least three passages in Isaiah that prophesy that the Messiah will be will have the Spirit. Here's one from 11, Isaiah 11, verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Next one, Isaiah 42, verse 1. God says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And then one more from Isaiah 61, verse 1. Here the the servant or the Messiah speaks. He says, The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, in the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And so by having the Holy Spirit descend upon Jesus and rest upon him at his baptism, God is signaling that this is his servant. This is his anointed one, the Messiah, who is the one Isaiah prophesied about, who will bring forth justice for the nations, who, who will bring forth liberty and and and, and um and release for the captives. He will be the one who will bring about salvation and deliverance. Now, it's not that Jesus didn't have the Spirit beforehand, wasn't already filled with the Spirit, in communion with the Spirit, but, but that now at this moment, at his baptism, God is officially commissioning Jesus for the work that he sent him to accomplish, which will culminate in his death for our sins and his resurrection on the third day. And finally, the last thing we'll consider today is my point four of today's sermon, uh, God the Father Speaks from Heaven. It's Matthew three seventeen. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay, this passage, or what God says here, echoes at least two, if not three, Old Testament passages. One we already read from Isaiah 42, where God says, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Uh, Several of uh, God's words in Matthew 3 echo that exact verse. And then also Psalm 2-7, where God says of of the Davidic king, um, the one who sits on David's throne, he says, You are my son. So put those two verses together, you get, You are my son, Uh, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. I um, just want to talk a little bit about what does it mean for Jesus to be God's son um, in Matthew's gospel. Well, it can mean more than one thing, and sometimes one or the other is emphasized. Um, it can mean, of course, if we remember chapter 1, that Jesus was not born or conceived in the normal way. Uh, there is no earthly father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. And so this points to the fact that's taught elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. In fact, he was never created. Uh, he, he, he was never made. He, he's always existed as God the Son, uh, begotten of the Father that signifies their relationship as a father to son, but, but not made. Um, but then at a certain point in history, God the Son became flesh. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit uh, of the Virgin Mary. He became flesh and he did this for us and for our salvation in order to be our mediator, our savior, our representative, and our substitute. So Jesus is God's son in like an ontological sense. Uh, Secondly, for Jesus to be God's son can mean uh, at certain places that, that Jesus is taking the place of Israel. Because at certain places in the Old Testament, God calls Israel my son. Matthew signals this in Matthew 2.15, where, where, you know, Joseph and Mary take Jesus and they go to Egypt. And then after a while, they come back. And Matthew says, this takes place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Um, Out of Egypt, I called my son. And there, my son is Israel, 
but now my son is Jesus. And so we see that Matthew is signaling to us that Jesus is in some sense taking the place of Israel or, or uh, doing what they were initially called to do, and he is retracing Israel's steps. And this is going to be even more obvious in Matthew 4 when Jesus continues to retrace Israel's steps because he goes out into the desert or wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and he is tempted. And yet where Israel fails, Jesus succeeds. And so sometimes Jesus being the Son of God can point to the fact that he is, it's like he's now Israel wrapped up in one person. Uh, third, to be the Son of God is also to be the, the promised Christ, the son of David. In 2 Samuel 7, 14, God promised to David about his offspring, his son. He said, I will be a father to him, and he shall be to me a son. And so there are some places in the Bible where the son of God specifically is the Christ, the Messiah, the son of David. And, and which one is it here? Well, I think we would do well to think of all of these things. When God the Father declares from heaven, this is is my beloved son with whom i am well pleased right and from this point on jesus was officially commissioned to do the work that god had sent him to earth to do his work involved initially here identifying himself with sinners standing in our place when when he's baptized Um, and his work would culminate by dying in our place dying in the place of sinners on the cross. And we know from Scripture that God the Father was well pleased with the finished work of his beloved Son. And that's a comfort to us, knowing that he did this as our Savior, as our representative, knowing that Jesus fulfilled all righteousness, even though we couldn't. He did this for us. He identified with us. Now the question is, have you identified with him? Have you been united with Jesus? Okay, he has already taken on your sins upon himself. He he has suffered and died and paid the penalty for your sins upon the cross. Now have you received his righteousness? This takes place uh, for, for every single person who repents of their sins and believes in him, that he is the Christ, that he is the Son of God. And this takes place for every single believer who is baptized because through baptism, We are united with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. This is the great exchange where where our sins have been laid upon Jesus. He bore them. He died for them. And and then we, on our part, we get his righteousness through faith and through baptism. Peace be to you in Christ. Amen.